test. Can you hear me? Can I get a thumbs up from somebody that they can hear me? All right. Very good. I want to welcome you all to my created space where I can be vocal about the issues I face. Today, I'm riled up, uh, really riled up, you know, because I truly believe my team and I are fighting a war. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist by any stretch of the imagination. I just am not. But this thing with upstream today, it does make me go, you know, WTF, what the F, man? I I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I would actually characterize myself as a theorist. I'm someone who considers whatever given facts I have to come up with some sort of an explanation to what I see in life. That's what a theorist does. A theorist observes phenomena and uses that reasoning to come up with a practical idea that actually can be proven. That's not a conspiracy theorist. A real theorist comes up with abstract ideas and then they spend their lives trying to prove them. So I am a theorist. I'm a theorist with my capital. I'm a theorist with my company, my team, and my shareholders. And here is my theory. My theory is that there is a power construct in this country, and in particular, one that preys upon the retail investors. It preys upon individuals. It does not prey upon the institutions because they are part of the power structure. It does not pay, prey on the wealthy. They are part of the power structure. It preys on us, the American public. And essentially, we are living in an era where, in my opinion, my theory is that the current SEC, in particular Gary Gensler, will see no progress made in blockchain because he has political aspirations and will be looking to people like Ken Griffin and the rest of the Citadel, Citadel Mafia to fund whatever campaign for whatever political position he wants because they are all part of a power construct. And I'm not saying that power construct is out to get the retail investment community. I think they're in the business of keeping their business going. And they're in the business of keeping their power construct in place. And blockchain, which many of you heard I've preached upon for a long time, threatens that power structure. The news out of upstream that only international investors will be able to trade on it is not coincidental. It comes at a time when multiple small cap companies, including our own, have had to rely for years on filing, in particular on the OTC, S1 statements to pay for our vendors, to pay for our uh, bonuses, mostly to insiders also to financiers, to register stock. Upstream, upstream and blockchain allows the theory, the theory that if you do not have to register stock the way you do as a small cap company, you can find alternative markets and alternative opportunities in the blockchain exchange to fund. Now, that funding and all the money that's made off of it shorting the entire small and micro cap space would come to a quick end if upstream blockchain and other aspects of alternative exchanges were allowed to exist. It would bring down the power structure that I referred to. It would bring down the citadels. And I say Citadel and Goldman Sachs and all the places that I used to admire. I used to admire the people, the business, everything that went on there. I was a part of that world for two decades. But what I see today 
is essentially a ton of small cap stocks who have looked to file S1s. Many of those stocks, like ours, are duly listed or were duly listed on the blockchain exchange. My S1 was held up by the SEC because they needed to do calls with me, which I took and talked about on a space. They needed to just have discussions. And I told everybody I was one of the first CEOs, if not the first, probably the first, that they called about it. Now, I am a target because I understand both worlds and have no fear of speaking to the SEC. And so I engaged them and I gave them my theories on duly listing. But they did not approve my S1 and would not approve it until I was forced, essentially, by given no other option, to withdraw from upstream so that I could clear my S1, save my company, all of your investments in us, and my jobs of my employees. But the S1 was not going to go through if we stayed on upstream. And this happened not just to me, but to multiple, multiple companies that were looking to register stock on their public markets, which they should have been allowed to do, and were not allowed to do because the SEC would not clear their S1s until they did. Now, why would they do this? Well, the narrative you'll hear is that well, we're going to continue exploring the opportunities that exist in the blockchain and make sure that shareholders are protected before we create an environment where companies, small, entrepreneurial, curing cancer, building platforms, building housing, whatever. But we will not let them gain access to capital other than through the power structure we have created. We will not let them, and this is how we'll do it. We just won't, we just won't approve their S1s. That's what happened. That's the truth. And so today, when I'm asked, what will we do now with today's news that upstream has now had to delay what was the progress they had made towards getting U.S. citizens to be able to participate actively in the future of capital markets. We will all have to wait as upstream continues its own discussions across the narrative of helping to eventually get shareholders such as yourselves to an alternative market where we can put to bed the abuses that we've seen for decades since the financial crisis, since as early as I started out on Wall Street. That's the truth. They're going to have to wait a while now. Because you're going to have to change regimes. There will have to be regime change at the regulatory agencies to facilitate change. But until then, unless the SEC figures out another way to stop me, I will list again on upstream. I will also assist all U.S. shareholders. There aren't many, very few in fact, that have actually transferred their shares over And so while upstream will not be a solution for them, upstream will be a solution for international buyers, many of which I will be speaking to. There are many family offices, hedge funds, fundamental investors around the world that cannot access an OTC stock. They cannot buy them because their power structures won't allow them to clear these stocks. They will not let the entrepreneur rise. Blockchain would have allowed us to do that. Blockchain still does for the international community. And we will still duly list so that the international community has access to our company, which currently is denied them by their own power structures. And that is my plan of action with Upstream. And with that, I'd like to open it up to any questions. Otherwise, I hope my words speak for themselves, but I am absolutely 
uh, asking for people to ask questions because clearly this is not something that you just understand after a quick call and a tirade by a CEO like myself who is not afraid to speak up about what he sees. Please, any questions, feel free to ask. All right, if you see any questions, we'll make them a speaker. Otherwise, we'll give it a minute. Uh, there can't be that there's not a single question amongst a listener when a CEO act. I wonder why would I keep doing this if you don't have questions? You must have a question. Let me see who is on here so that I, oh, there is one request. Who is the request from? Oh, good. Michael. Michael, you are you are always you are always up for the challenge of asking a good question. Thank you for participating. Yes. So what are your plans at this point with OG or any any plans going forward without blockchain? Well, it doesn't impact OG, meaning recently I've because I, I did not even know this was happening, but since we've made so much progress, I've been recently going down the path with our attorneys of when we spin out OG, OG for a certain period, no matter what, would be a private company that we would have spun out to all shareholders. And at that moment in time, it creates the same problem for shorts, which is how do you develop, how do you deliver a private share of a company? Now, my intention was then to double uh, FTS and and list on upstream, which would have provided a second level of pain. The first level of pain is the spinoff itself, the corporate action. Then the question becomes, all right, well, would you list OG on the OTC or on a New York exchange or the New York Stock Exchange? And the answer to that is only if I believed that the value that was going to be created to the that, sorry for the play on words, the value that was going to be uh, um, facilitated for the created shareholders it was spun off to was worth it. Meaning, if I believe that the OG could be um, listed on the New York at a $20 million valuation or $15 million valuation, then I would do it because that would give all of the OG holders who might want to get out instead of waiting around for a, whatever the final valuation is through an exit or through some other action, it gives them liquidity. So the nice thing about upstream was that it would have given liquidity and it would have given liquidity where the sellers can't abuse the system. That said, if the liquidity and the value align on a different exchange, I would still list the OG for that opportunity as well. And I know that there are a ton of people out there that'll say, you can't do that. It'll attack the, na the naked shorts will attack. Well, maybe they will. And maybe we'll have to come out with another aspect of battle. But this is, as I said, a war, right, Michael? So like, there's always, just because today they're attacking doesn't mean that there aren't 10 other maneuvers. It just means today we have been shown the truth of the power structure that is decimating the American capital markets. And as far as created is concerned, this won't impact our ability to move forward. It takes one weapon off the table, but over time we've already come up with multiple other ones because that is all we do these days as a management team is fight the war in the markets. I hope that helps Michael understand what we're doing next. It it does. The private company, I think, is a great idea, and I've been talking with others about this. How do we as shareholders gain access to the value if someone wanted to sell? Or I personally don't know much about the private part of it. Can you explain some of how that might work? Yeah, sure. We'll probably, this is why I've talked about the reg CF before, um, because what happens is if we do a reg CF, right, we'll create a value on the OG and then whatever the reg CF shares are will be registered at the same time. Well, so like a reg CF, you can't trade out of a reg CF and in, in, into like between two people without it being a 
registered security for a year. After that, you can, you can theoretically trade out of a reg CF. And I think I've spoken about on some of my uh, spaces, how there are platforms being created today, uh, technology that I'm aware of to be able to facilitate trading a reg CF that you purchased a year ago, a share in a private company. What we would do is we would register both the reg CF shares and the shares that we're distributing to creators for owners of created um, uh, at the same time to allow, allow them to be able to be on the same timeline to gain liquidity. Now, before that year is up, we may or may not have made a decision to list it, like I said, on another exchange. In the interim, you're not able to generate that value. What you are able to do as a created shareholder is watch some uh, uh, fail to delivers when people go in and ask for their uh, certs for their certs because there are going to be certs for the private ownership. So if a broker dealer cannot deliver an official OG share owner certification to a created shareholder, they are naked short and they have a problem. And so that's. That's how that is meant to work. We'll see how that goes. I'm sure I will be in multiple conversations at least as we get closer to announcing the record date. Many people are hostile and angry and blame me for not having done the OG yet. I can't tell you how happy I am that this is the time that we're finally getting through the OG because I didn't know as much as I did about reg CFs. I didn't know as much as I did about do about blockchain now. I didn't know as much as about registering private companies and creating value for shareholders. I didn't know any of that because I didn't know when I began the process of simply trying to do this, how much backlash and what kind of power structures I would have to fight to pull off the OG and how much money we would have to raise just to pay auditors, lawyers, accountants, because forget the, reg the regulations we face. There's a world of cottage industries that overcharges and often fails to deliver to hundreds, thousands of small and micro cap companies. I am lucky enough now to work with three groups that I think do the job, but it's scary out there if you can't. So waiting all this time to do the OG did not do any harm and value to all my shareholders. And if any shareholders were in it for the short squeeze that the OG would create, good for them, but that's not my purpose. My purpose is to create value for my long-term shareholders, not to help out a bunch of pump and dumpers. And so that's where I come out on, on the OG in general, Michael. Any other questions on the OG or anything else? from anybody else. I, I saw another request, please. And Reclaimer. I feel like people have to take their, uh, their Twitter handles very seriously. Like, I don't know what to call myself, so I just called myself my name. I would, Reclaimer. I hope that has some meaning for it you. Does. What does reclaim? It does. Yes. Good. I, I hope I hope it does for everybody's handles. I, Mike Michael's kind of like me, the last speaker. He, it's just his name. Uh, so. Same goes with the Kintsugi <laughs> there in my name as well. That also has a deeper meaning behind it too. But uh, I just want to start off by saying thank you for doing these spaces. Um, you know, having a CEO being as vocal as you are about this is. Uh, very valuable. I wish more CEOs did that as well. Um, I have a couple quick questions to go over here with you. Um, first one, pretty simple one. What benefits do you think tokenized shares have over traditional shares that you might buy from brokers like Robinhood or Fidelity? I mean, first and foremost is just the transparency of it, right? Um, so shares that are tokenized by definition, there's no, if every share was tokenized in a company, uh, and and someone was, because I'm sure even with tokenization, they'll figure out how to short stocks, but they won't be able to short them. You'll, you'll know who is short them. That's That visibility and transparency are the most important thing. 
thank you. I, I kind of definitely agree there with that. Um, so the next I mean, question, look, I, you, you saw. I don't know if you all saw today's news with Korea, which look, it's small, it's small, but it's an example of what's happening, right? Like tokenization is the only answer if you want transparency, and I believe that we're going to watch because America is just falling behind all over the place these days. We are just falling behind. And we are looking at, you know, look at South Korea. I, 10 years from now, we'll all be applauding the South Korean markets for banning shorting or moving towards those type of positions and moving towards digital markets. That's what's going to happen throughout the Asian continent. And once again, we'll be at the tail end of it because all we can do is create, you know, the same type of echo chamber behavior that we see recurring over and over again, where we stay away from the real issues, such as tokenization. Please continue. Yeah, so the, the next question here, um, I don't know how much you've looked into direct registration there of shares, um, but do you believe tokenization of shares has any benefit over directly registering your shares? Um, not, not really. I mean, I, I'll tell you a couple of uh, uh, things that I would say are different between the two. So first, let's look at direct registration, right? So yeah, it's great. And I, I wish every long term holder could take that time, right to do that. So my shares are directly registered as but I have to be as the CEO. So if I sell shares, which I have never, ever done, never, if I sell shares, then you're aware of it because mine are directly registered and because I'm CEO. Now, if you directly register your shares, yes, we would be able to keep track of the fact that you directly registered your shares. And I liken that to like the analog world. Hear me out, everybody who's on the call. I liken the notion of direct registration to the analog world because the power structure that I've been talking about limits what I can do with that information. It limits it on a number of dimensional ways. It limits it first and foremost from access in any other pipeline other than its own pipeline. And so you can't really do as much with that information because the power structure would rather you not. Meaning, why doesn't every, every broker deal that we talk, they always talk about, you need to be a long-term, and E.F. Hutton says, be a long-term investor, but Berkshire Hathaway, long-term investor. Okay, well, if everybody's such a long-term investor, why don't those same broker dealers say, so register your shares for protection and long-term value? They don't because they make most of their money by you doing the exact opposite. And so they don't look for you to directly register and they don't give you much to go on. And I look at it like the analog era. Now, if you look at tokenization of shares and the promise of the blockchain, you could do whatever you want with that data. It's malleable, massageable. I can attach coupons to it because I know who everybody is. I can give people free memberships on Vocal who invest. I can do anything because it exists in the, in the digital world, not the analog world. And so when we say our tokenization and direct registration essentially the same thing, yes, they accomplish the same goal in transparency, but no, technically, you would rather the future, the future be one in where we've digitized all of this and we stop behaving like we're in an analog world. I hope that answers the direct registration versus digital tokenization. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, me personally, I think about the only big upgrade that you would have for tokenized shares over DRS outside of what you were just mentioning um, would be you potentially being able to choose the exchange in which you get to sell your share whenever it comes time for you doing that. Um, absolutely, but I, I'd like to live in a world where I can list our company on multiple exchanges multiple right across right. the acro across the globe that's that's the dream and that's why tokenization will yield that faster than direct registration tokenization will increase the shareholder base more i guess that would be another thing i would add to that one 
But thank you for the questions. Any other questions from that you have? I, I do have I do have more questions. Um, feel free to cut me off whenever, though. Um, so the next question here, again, kind of going into the same vein here with tokenized um, stocks. Do you see any potential drawbacks for them? Um, you know, with potentially what happened there with FTX, them being possibly used as locates, um, yeah. or just go ahead. Yeah, but not if it's regulated. Meaning, and that's what my tirade is about: is that the SEC refuses because they are. Uh, uh, tied to this power structure, they refuse to embrace the future. The, the whole tagline when we all yell at Gensler on, on Twitter, it should, it should just be, hey, man, stop, just embrace the future already. Like, not fuck Gary Gensler. We don't need to say that. What we need to say is, hey, embrace the future. Because a regulated tokenization will be okay. A tokenization without regulation, which is what blockchain was trying, which is what um, Upstream was at, at the forefront of, and still is at the forefront of, because I think in the end, Elinowitz and Upstream will win their battle too, because there is no correct legal argument, in my opinion, that the SEC has to not allow us to duly list. Well, they're not saying they're not allowing it, actually. The SEC has not come out and said you can't list. That's not what they've said. That's not the narrative. The narrative is, Jeremy, you have an S1 you're trying to clear, and we're just going to keep it in motion for a long time because we don't understand the full implications yet of being blue listed. And it could take us years to figure that out. And so um, tokenization worries me in a world where corruption is as uh, as uh, easy to find in all these power structures. Tokenization worries me without regulation. And my greatest frustration is that America as a country has not come together to solve this problem and create an environment where tokenization can be regulated. I, it, we won't have an end to banking freeze until it's regulated. And and the only people that make money until then are the lawyers who clean up all the mess. Just the lawyers. So, you know, tokenization worries me because corruption worries me. Regulation worries me because overregulation by power structures doesn't help either. And so finding the right balance, which we will find because we do solve things, and I am an optimist in the human spirit, particularly the American human spirit. And in this country, no matter how things are looking right now, on so many fronts, my front is just one tiny speck of dust. But at least I will fight on my front to improve what's happening in this country when it comes to the capital markets. But that's how I come out on tokenization from where I think we have to be concerned. We must have some form of regulation and we must steer clear of corruption and best done through tokenization, irrespective of how fast regulation works because of the, the transparency that exists in general in tokenization. So why don't we see if there's any other questions? I've been talking now for 30 minutes. I, I'd love to give any, anybody else a chance to speak. Otherwise, I'll take one more question from a claimer. And uh, if there's anybody else who has a question, again, I do these calls. It's so important to me. If you appreciate that I do these calls, it's important to me that you ask questions so I can know the things that you're thinking about as listeners. Um, with that, there's nobody else. Reclaimer, one other question if you have it. Otherwise, we can call it a yeah. day. Yeah, thank you again for the time. Um, so last question here. Um, if things, for some reason, don't end up panning out there with Upstream, have you considered looking into other ones like potentially T0 as an alternative? Yes, I've done I've done many a call with T0 executives and and know them well. And like I said, this is this is one weapon that could have been used one way, but it now will be used another way, which is to increase our international global exposure. But it won't be used at this moment in time for the one particular weapon that I was thinking of. But there's no reason why OG can't be considered as, as a non-trading entity 
OG is much easier for me to list on T0 now. And so, as I said, I will be coming out with news on OG and what our plan is and what the record date and what it all is soon enough, even though it feels like an eternity that we've been waiting. But T0 and other options like that are all on the table for us, all of them. All right. Thank you so much again. Remember, as I said earlier, you know, I appreciate this. Uh, it is important for me to have my created space where I can be vocal about the issues that I face. Thank you all for joining today. Very good.